Hey everybody, this video lesson is going to cover the concept known as intermolecular forces. The definition of intermolecular forces are they are weak attractions between molecules. Intermolecular forces are not considered to be a bond like an ionic or covalent bond, but rather a weak attraction between molecules. In fact, they are much weaker than bonds. If you were to put them in order from weakest to strongest, intermolecular forces would be the weakest attraction. But they are still considered a, an attraction like a bond would be. So here's the list. At the bottom, or the weakest, are the intermolecular forces, followed by nonpolar covalent, then polar covalent, and the strongest type of bond is the ionic bond. So on the continuum of weak to strong, they are at the bottom with ionic bond at the top. Now, as far as intermolecular forces go, there are two types of intermolecular forces. One is stronger than the other. The stronger of the two is called a dipole-dipole force. The other is called a London dispersion force, and it is the weaker of the two. We're going to take some time to identify which type of molecules exhibit the dipole-dipole force and the London dispersion force, and also discuss the reasons why. You might be asking yourself, well, how do these molecules attract one another? It has to be something that's oppositely charged that allows them to have an attraction. And it all has to do with the molecular polarity of the molecule you're looking at. Remember in a previous conversation, we talked about how certain shaped molecules are always polar. And I'm going to illustrate how molecules attract one another using two of these polar molecules. Here I've drawn two SO2 molecules, and as you can see by the way I drew them, they are bent, and that is one of the shapes that is always polar. We know it's bent because it has two bonding domains and two lone pair domains. That is true of both molecules, two bonds and two lone pair. Now if you illustrate or zoom in on one of the molecules, what you'll find is that there are some bond dipoles. Oxygen is more electronegative, and so oxygen is pulling the electrons out towards it. We label the dipoles using these arrows with the cross tail. Now, the molecular dipole exists because of the shape, which means that we can also label a positive side and a negative side of the molecule, just like we labeled the positive side and the negative side of a bond. And so if I take a close look at the molecule, and identify the area that's the average between the two negative sides of the bond. So we have a negative bond over here on this side and a positive side of the bond and a positive side of the bond here and a negative side here. And the average of them is right in between the two oxygens. And we have a different symbol we use to designate the negative side of a molecule. And it is kind of a hard one to draw, but it's kind of a squiggled line that looks like an S. And in between the two oxygens is this squiggly line, and it's a partial negative charge. Now this symbol means partial, not a full negative charge, but a partial negative charge. And since the tail ends of the positive sides of the tails are up here near the sulfur, that means that the sulfur has the partial positive part. So now I've labeled the two sides of my molecule. Because it's polar molecule, it has to have opposite sides. And this is the negative side, and this is the positive side. Now when two of these molecules get close enough to each other, both exhibiting their positive and negative dipoles, they may form an attraction. Again, I draw in the bond dipoles of the sulfur oxygen and label the spot in between the two oxygens as the partial negative charge. It's just an empty space but it's the average of the two oxygens. And then the opposite side of the molecule is the partial positive. And now, since these two molecules are really close to one another, they can form a positive-negative attraction between the positive side of one molecule and the negative side of another. And that is the intermolecular force. That positive-negative attraction between two different molecules. If you break down the word intermolecular, what it means is, between molecules. Inter means between, molecular referring to molecules. So it's an attractive force between molecules. And this is how it works, by positive negative attraction of opposite molecules. As I mentioned before, there are two types of intermolecular forces. There's the dipole-dipole force and the London dispersion. We're going to talk about the dipole-dipole force. Dipole-dipole force only shows up between polar molecules. So nonpolar molecules will not exhibit this force. In fact, 
the intermolecular force that I showed you on the last slide between the sulfur dioxide molecules is a is a dipole dipole force. All polar molecules have a positive and a negative end, and we designate that end as the partial negative or partial positive. This number or this symbol means partial. So it's not a full negative charge, but it's only a half. Think of it as a half negative and a half positive. Because the molecule itself isn't ionic, it's covalent, but it's got a negative and a positive sign. Dipole-dipole force occurs because the positive side of one molecule attracts the negative side of a different one. To illustrate it one more time, I'm going to show you two different molecules attracting one another using dipole-dipole forces. Here are two C H2Cl2 molecules. You've got one on the left and one on the right, and I've drawn in the bond dipoles. Now the HC dipole is pointing in towards the carbon because carbon is slightly more electronegative than hydrogen. But the CCl dipole is pointing out towards the chlorine because chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. And so you see the arrows pointing down into the left and down into left in both cases. So if I were to label the dipole on this left molecule for the overall molecular polarity, which is not something I'd expect you to know how to do, but I'd do it for you, I would put it between the two chlorines. Because if you look at where the arrows are pointing, oh, down into the left, down into the left, the furthest down into the left part of the molecule is right here between the chlorines. And so all of the bonds taking into account, this is tetrahedral, and that is normally a nonpolar shape, but because the elements on the outside are not the same, and the dipoles aren't canceling, the dipole, the negative side of the dipole, is down here in the lower left-hand corner of the molecule. That means the opposite side of the molecule must be the positive side. Because the positive side of the molecule is the opposite side of where the negative is. It's where the electrons aren't. If negative charged electrons are all out towards the chlorines because the bond dipoles are pulling them out in that direction, then the positive side must be up here on the opposite side. So in red, I've labeled the dipole-dipole force. It's the attraction between the negative side of one molecule and the positive side of a different polar molecule. We're going to talk about the second of the two forces. It's the London dispersion force, which sometimes I refer to as LDF. And compared to dipole-dipole, it is much, much weaker. Now it is a measurable attraction, but it is much weaker than the dipole-dipole force. The only reason it's around is because molecules have mass. All molecules have mass, so all molecules have a very weak attraction to one another. Simply saying that a molecule has mass assumes that they have a weak, weak attraction known as a London dispersion force. You might be wondering, how in the world does that even exist? And all I can say to you is it is a fundamental observation of nature. Just simply existing means that you have a, even a small attraction to other molecules. That includes nonpolar molecules. Nonpolar molecules don't have dipoles. That's the whole idea or the definition behind nonpolar. They don't have a positive or negative side, but somehow they attract one another regardless, and it's because they have mass. Since they have mass, they exhibit London dispersion forces. Now, polar molecules also have mass and also exhibit London dispersion forces. And so it's worth noting that all molecules, polar or nonpolar, exhibit London dispersion. So to put it plainly, all molecules, polar and nonpolar, have London dispersion. So let's break down intermolecular forces exhibited based on a table here, polar and nonpolar. So on the left we have polar, on the right we have nonpolar. Polar exhibit London dispersion and dipole-dipole forces. And remember this easily because polar molecules are the only ones with dipoles, and so they exhibit dipole-dipole. Nonpolar molecules, on the other hand, only exhibit London dispersion. So the next thing I want to talk about is what the existence of intermolecular forces tell us is about the observable world. Because these things exist, there are certain things that we can look for to show that they exist. The primary thing I'm going to talk about are melting points and boiling points, or in other words, temperatures at which substances turn from solid to liquid or liquid to gas. States of matter exist. We know this. We can observe this. They're all around us. You can come up with tons of things that are solids, tons of things that are liquids, and tons of things that are gases. 
What you may not realize is that things that are solid exist as solid because of their intermolecular forces, just as things that exist at gases are gases because of their intermolecular forces. Let's assume the temperature is held constant. And if you look at three different samples of matter, a solid, a liquid, and a gas at equal temperatures, you can make a judgment about the strength of their intermolecular forces. Because things that are solid at 25 degrees Celsius have fairly high intermolecular forces. Because if they had low intermolecular forces, they would simply turn to liquid or even to gas. What keeps a solid solid at 25 degrees Celsius is the fact that the particles are attracted to each other very strongly. So things exist as solid at this temperature because of higher intermolecular forces. Now let's look at the other end of the spectrum, gases. Now these particles are not very attracted to one another at 25 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, if they were very attracted, they would condense and then solidify and turn into a solid. So the fact that gas exists as a gas at 25 degrees Celsius tells me that these have very low intermolecular forces. So what this means is at 25 degrees Celsius, things that are gas have low intermolecular forces. IMF stands for intermolecular forces. And things that are solid have high IMF. You could go even further and say, it's fairly likely that these substances that are solids at 25 degrees Celsius are polar molecules because they exhibit the strongest types of intermolecular forces. And these substances that have low intermolecular forces at 25 degrees Celsius must only exhibit London dispersion, or in other words, are nonpolar molecules. These are some judgments that you can make about solids, liquids, and gases when the temperature is held constant. You can claim with fairly high certainty that things that are solid are most likely polar or even ionic, which remember, an ionic bond is something that's even stronger than a covalent bond and even stronger than polar molecules. And so ionic substances are even more likely to be solid at room temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius. So let's talk about this graphically. If you take a look at a graph of melting temperature in degrees Celsius versus strength of intermolecular forces, it'd be safe to say that something with high intermolecular forces has a high melting point temperature. And something with a medium strength of intermolecular forces would have a medium melting temperature, and something with low intermolecular forces, meaning their intermolecular forces are very weak, would have a very low melting temperature. If you graphed the melting point temperature versus strength of intermolecular forces, what you get would be a positive slope line. So in other words, the stronger the intermolecular forces is something exhibits, the higher the melting temperature. To give you some real world examples, let me talk about two very common substances. Let's call this dot water. Water is a polar molecule, and polar molecules exhibit dipole-dipole and -dipole London forces. And water melts at zero degrees Celsius, and you might be thinking, well, that's pretty cold. But in fact, compared to other molecules, that's pretty warm. Let's take, for example, carbon dioxide. The gas that you're breathing out all the time is a nonpolar molecule. If you wrote out the Lewis dot structure, it's linear with carbon in the middle and two double bonds either side. But in the point I'm trying to make is it's a nonpolar molecule. And its melting point is at about negative 80 degrees Celsius, which is not even a temperature that you can reach here on Earth. But if you were to synthetically produce a negative 80 degree Celsius freezer, for example, you could make carbon dioxide uh, liquefy and then freeze at negative 80 degrees Celsius. So simply saying this, that the stronger the intermolecular forces due to the polarity of water makes the melting point 80 degrees higher. And that's a strong correlation of all molecules known to exist. The higher the intermolecular forces, the higher the melting point. Well, that takes care of this video lesson. Thanks for listening.